am very excited to be behind this pulpit because I love this ministry and I love David's preaching. It's expositional. It's not what we see today with the, the topics, you know, seven ways of having a successful Christian life or some nonsense like that or how to develop friendships or dating or anything like that. He's always expositional and uh, for that uh, I am so grateful. By way of introduction, um, of course you saw the passage we're going to be discussing, discussing. This is one of my favorite passages. Why? And it, it was weird because when David asked me to teach, I had been focused on this passage realizing that I put it in almost every article. I do, but I've never done an article on it. It's never, I've never really developed it. And the reason why I like Luke 17, 20 through 37, and also Luke 21, is that Jesus combines the arrival of the kingdom with his parousia in that generation, or when you connect the parable of the widow with Luke 17, it's going to shortly take place. The vindication is shortly going to take place. So we have the nature of fulfillment, spiritual, within, and you also have the timing of when the kingdom's coming and when the parousia is coming. There is this phrase that is thrown out, especially in scholarship, it's called the already and not yet. Do we know what that is? Of course, New Testament teaches that through Christ's blood, death, resurrection, ascension, the church was saved past tense. It was being saved, and at the parousia, it would fully be saved. And all these futuristic views hold this paradigm, but have all kinds of contradictions. I remember I was at the Criswell conference when Don Preston was giving a lecture on the millennium with some other scholars, such as G.K. Beale, Ken Gentry, and some premillennial scholars, and they all kind of fought. And every time one person would get his millennial view caught in a contradiction, he would use this magical phrase, well, the already and not yet. And all the other scholars, oh, yes, yes, of course, of course, the already and not yet. So any contradiction is just kind of thrown under the bus of what the already and not yet is. But being the troublemaker I am, I would actually go up to G.K. Beale and say, you know, you're talking about the second coming being soon and at hand, and you admit it's the second coming, but every time you mention the time statements, you talk about the inauguration or the already of eschatology, but it's the not yet. And they just really don't know how to deal with that at all. Especially if you're an amillennialist and you believe there's only one second coming in the New Testament or that your confession tells you the coming of Christ in Revelation um, is future. That's a real big problem. And so they have all kinds of tension with this. I'm not sure how to scroll down. Ah, there we go. Um, so my, object, my objective this morning is to show you that it wasn't just the already of the kingdom that was at hand in the first century. It was the eschatological not yet. And when the coming came, so did his kingdom, and it was within the hearts of his people. We're also going to touch on some questions that David had um, last week and I think the week before. And the question was, well, do we have any church fathers? Do we have any writings of any Christians that believe that the second coming happened in AD 70? And may we, not, we might not, and Jeff has done a good job on doing some history of that in the early church, we do have a, screer, a clear scriptural reference in Mark 9.1 where Jesus uses the past tense and he says that you will know that the Son of Man has come, already come, in his kingdom when you see the destruction of Jerusalem. And so we don't need to run to Josephus. We don't need a church father because we have scripture teaching this. We have Jesus teaching this. <clears throat> so let's break down some of these systems. Dispensationalism, how do they deal with the already and not yet? Well, they believe that all the Old Testament promises made to Israel cannot be fulfilled in the church. Then you have progressive dispensationalists like John MacArthur who say, uh, that's kind of rough because the New Testament's using a lot of Old Testament scriptures and applying it to the church. So his view is kind of contradictory, but the, the, the thing is with dispensationalism, at least they're consistent. 
They say that the eschatological not yet is dealing with Israel, and we have to have a physical land, we have to have a physical temple, we have to have a physical five foot seven Jesus floating down. He's going to sit on a physical throne. He's going to sit next to a physical temple with animal sacrifices. They're completely consistent on how Israel would be restored. The hermeneutic is consistent. I, at least I applaud them for that. Totally contrary to what Jesus taught, but at least they're trying to be consistent. Historic premillennialism, guys like Michael Brown, whom you might have seen debate Don Preston, they don't want to go that route with that temple and sacrifice stuff. So when they're debating all millennials and all these other people, they just want to talk about the land promises. But he's not consistent because he should be talking about the restoration of the temple and sacrifice systems, sacrificial system. Now, even some dispensationalists say, well, the sacrifice, the sacrifices of the temple, that might be the church. I don't know if I want to go that far. But once you take that away, the whole system falls apart. Because if you don't have literal sacrifices, you can't have a literal priesthood, physical priesthood. You can't have a physical temple. And it just, the dominoes go down. And we're on the other side. We're consistent. We see that the eschatological not yet has come at Christ's coming in AD 70, and that all these things are spiritual. It's a spiritual kingdom. All millennialism. Sure, the kingdom was at hand, in a sense. We're spiritually in the kingdom now. But when Christ comes in the future, we're going to have a lot of things that are going to be seen. The new heavens and new earth, that's going to be physical. The resurrection of the body, that's going to be physical. Five foot seven Jew coming down a cloud, that's going to be physical. It's going to be physically seen. Someday when the kingdom comes. Of course, that's totally contrary to what Jesus says, but that's their position. Postmillennialism, how do they solve the problem? Well, they make up two comings of Christ, two ends of the ages, two resurrections, two judgments of the living and the dead, two parousias, two arrivals of the new creation, passing of the creation, and it's just a mess because they're trying to have one foot in the creeds and try to deal with New Testament imminence. And it just goes nowhere. We're going to also develop some concepts of the new exodus or second exodus. exodus and what, who the people of light really were during the times of Jesus. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls and we know from uh, other sources that there were some Jews during Jesus' day that believed this age was the Old Covenant age and the age to come is the Messianic age. And that during, in between there, when Messiah comes, he's going to recapitulate Israel's history, and we're going to have a second exodus. And they said it would be a 40 years generation, the wilderness wandering being the type. Read Hebrews 3 and 4, following that same exact model. Now, they were right on the timing, and the Jews believed, hey, we're living in the Roman Empire, the time of the Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom, world kingdom. Messiah's got to come now. They had an imminent expectation of the kingdom. The Essenes in the wilderness, they considered themselves to be children of the light. They believed they were the new covenant community. They believed that they were about to have a 40-year war based upon the typology of David and that they were going to go to war with Rome and apostate of the apostate priesthood in Jerusalem, and that God was going to deliver them in the Battle of Gog and Magog. So some of these views were right when it came to the timing of the kingdom, but they were radically off on the nature of the kingdom. Nor did they pay attention to their Old Testament scriptures. Daniel 2, 7, 9, 12, what do we hear? The kingdom's going to come and the time of the Roman Empire, but it's going to be spiritual. It's going to be a stone cut without hands, not a physical kingdom. So when Jesus is saying the kingdom is not of this world, it's within you, they should have been going back, you know what? Yeah, that stone, it was cut without hands. That means it's in the spiritual realm. What did uh, Isaiah say in Isaiah 28? He says, you're going to consider it a strange work. You're going to reject the stone, the Messiah, and it's going to be a strange work for you. Why is it going to be strange? Because God's going to destroy you, not the Romans. 
Deuteronomy 32 says that they wouldn't be able to discern their end when it came in that specific crooked and perverse generation that Peter says they were living in. Actually citing Deuteronomy 32, 5 and 20. So the predictions were there, that the kingdom was spiritual and that they wouldn't be able to figure it out. It was all in front of them in the scriptures. But their carnal concepts of the kingdom continued. And futurists, all brands today, have simply postponed that same carnal mentality of what the kingdom is going to look like. They've kind of got, yeah, we want it spiritual, but when it comes, it's going to be physical. But Luke 17, he is dealing with the not yet of the kingdom. Let's begin with John the Baptist. We're going to go through Luke, just going to do a quick survey, and we're going to look at the eschatology of John the Baptist and Jesus and how Luke describes it, the various Greek words he uses when we're looking at this already and not yet. The first thing we learn in chapter 1 is what? And he will turn many, talking about John, children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Okay? It's not about people flying off the earth this way that he's going to prepare. It's about forgiveness of sins. It's dealing with the heart. That's the first thing we need to look at. And you, child, John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise, we're going to come back to that, shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. G.K. Beale and D.A. Carson write, in the Septuagint, the cognate verb, Anatalo is also used to refer to sunrise or the imagery of light. Now, remember David mentioned Numbers 24:17 last week, dealing with the time issue, but let's look at the nature of fulfillment here. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. 2,000, you know, many years away. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. I want you to Keep that star, that sunrise, uh, the dawning. I want you to pay attention to these things. He also mentions Malachi 3.20 and uh, 4.2. This light imagery seems to fit the Lucan context better. First, the phrase from on high fits well with the imagery of the rising sun. Second, the theme of light and darkness in its immediate context, verse 7, 79, also favors this reading. Third, in Isaiah, the verb atello frequently appears to the context of God's eschatological restoration. And this may have also contributed to the use of this imagery of dawn here. This light imagery also survives in Jewish traditions that, people, uh, that point to the eschatological hope of Israel. Of course, John is full of the, the new Exodus motif. The first thing we find is he's, he's in a desert, and what is he doing? He's baptizing, but he's baptizing where? In the Jordan. Where did the people of Israel have to get their hearts right as God had tested them for 40 years and raised up a new generation of, of believing Israelites? They had to get their hearts right before Joshua brought them into the land. In a sense, they were rebaptized, And that is what's taking place. If you're a Jew and you knew you were constantly thinking in terms of the new exodus, you knew exactly what was going on. You knew exactly what John the Baptist was saying. He says, prepare a smooth way or road for the king. Luke 3, 4, Isaiah 4, 40. Um, the kingdom is at hand. Now, most people, when they see this Isaiah 40 reference, they want to talk about the already of the kingdom. Oh, yeah, John the Baptist, he was preaching an at-hand kingdom. So it was going to happen real soon. And this way, the highway of holiness, Jesus is the way, he's salvation, 
it's all, you know, the kingdom's here in my heart right now. But is that really the entire message of John the Baptist? See, they cut it off at the already. They don't want to talk about the Jesus and John when they say the kingdom of God is at hand. They're talking about the judgment, too. They're talking about the not yet. And that's where our PhDs in theology and, and traditions just get so confused. Because all they have to do is read these Old Testament con uh, passages in their context. Look at Mark MacArthur. We're going to continue in the tradition here of picking on my former pastor, college president. He says, the kingdom is now manifested in heaven's spiritual rule over the hearts of believers. Now, he's quoting the passage that we're going to be dealing with here in a little while. And one day we'll be established in a literal earthly kingdom, Revelation 20. I, there's nothing in Revelation 20 that talks about an earthly kingdom. At hand means, in one sense, the kingdom is present, is a present reality, but in its fullest sense, it awaits a yet future literal fulfillment. He doesn't know what he doesn't know how to deal with this passage. He's not looking at all of the terms that John is using. Is John just saying the already is spiritual and, and it's going to take place soon? Or is he talking about the not yet? He says he's preaching a judgment and wrath that was about to or soon to come. Luke 3, 7. It's also present in Matthew's version. He says the axe was ready at the root of the trees. Judgment was right around the corner. His winnowing fork was in his hand as well as the axe. And this winnowing fork is the tool that they used for the harvest time, the great harvest, the time of the resurrection, the end of the age. That's what this tool would be used for, the end part of the harvest, not the beginning. And then, of course, he talks about his... Uh, Connecting the winnowing fork with the, with the um, let's see here, with the threshing floor. And John Gill says that the threshing floor in the Old Testament is always the land of Israel. So you have a local setting, you have a local judgment that is about to take place. And that is how the kingdom is going to be manifested in an at hand period. Uh, I, I hate to even just stop here as I'm going through Luke, but man, we're having some problems with this in the preterist community. I'm not sure why. I think it started with Lloyd Dale. I, and then I think because as preterists we focus on salvation is of the Jews, that for some reason uh, it's kind of given rise to hyper-preterism, all eight people of them in the entire world. But... Uh, <laughs> This concept that when we come across Gentiles in the Gospels or in the Epistles, that it really means Jews. They're just the lost tribes of Israel. No. And not only that, but Luke himself is a Gentile, and he contributed. He was a physician, a historian, a missionary companion of Paul, and wrote a quarter of the New Testament. And I don't have time to develop this theme because I'm developing another thing, but uh, in the Gospel of Luke and in Acts, he, is, he hits hard this theme of Gentile inclusion and Gentile salvation, that Messiah has come for them as well. It says in verse 27, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. You will prepare your way before you. Now, at first we're thinking, oh, we're in Luke 7. He just got done saying that in Luke 3. It's just, he's just repeating it. No, you got to pay attention, because now he's conflating two other Old Testament passages, and connecting it to the way. And they are Exodus 23, again, the new Exodus theme, Malachi 3 and 4, and Isaiah 40. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these passages real quick. Uh, Michael Heiser has done a great job on the angel of the Lord. You know, one passage says God did something. Another passage says the angel did something. And Michael Heiser says what? Yeah. Angels, God. And so the angel, they were very aware uh, in the wilderness wandering that the angel would protect them in the rear guard, and then the pillar of fire would lead them at night, and then during the day, the cloud would lead them. So they were very aware of the angel. But in this context, look, behold, I send an, an, the, an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. 
So Luke is telling you again, we're going through the new exodus. And God was involved in the first exodus, his guidance, his protection, him leading us into the land, him being a part of fighting for us in the land. That's Jesus. Here he is again. He's the one that we're to look to on this way. Malachi 3.1, Behold, I send my messenger, John, as Elijah, and he will prepare the way before me, that is Christ, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple in judgment, that is Christ's second coming, and the messenger of the new covenant, Christ, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming, the second coming, and who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire. Does this just, this way of salvation, does it just sound like just salvation? Or is there a judgment that's dealing with this way? Absolutely. It's an eschatological judgment dealing with the second coming of Christ. That is what John is preparing. That is what John is saying is at hand. Now, let's continue into chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evil, evil doers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither a root or branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his some rays or wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Behold, I send you Elijah, that's John, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This phrase, leaping like calves from the stall, refers to the Christians in Jerusalem that would joyfully flee the city when they saw the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem right before the Lord's second coming, described for us as sun shining from the east to the west. In obedience to Jesus' warning in Luke 21, uh, 20 through 27, Luke 17, and also in Matthew 24. Matthew Poole writes, You shall go forth, go out of harm's way, out of Jerusalem, before the fatal siege, obeying the call from heaven. Go hence to Pella and that of Christ. What about the great and awesome day of the Lord here? This further clarifies the earlier reference of Christ's second coming described as the son of righteousness the great and awesome day of the lord he comes as a uh, as the a son of righteousness to burn up the wicked and give life to his people that is the imagery and they're both referring to the second coming of christ now what about these people say we don't see preterism anywhere you guys are coming up with something new you're a cult wait a second I can take John the Baptist's eschatology, I can take Jesus and Luke, and form full preterism. Commentators throughout church history say, this is the second coming. Commentators will say, no, nope, happened in AD 70, spiritually. Great. That's what we believe. The truth has been with us the whole time. I mean, I didn't come to full preterism because I, you know, read Max King or... You know, I was studying Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 in my dorm room. And I was reading all millennials, and I was reading partial predators, and I just, wow. I don't think this is an either-or situation. I think it's a both-and. They both make sense. Man, the second coming must have happened. And then God would, you know, providentially guide me from there. Uh, strike the land with a curse. Of course, Luke 21 talks about that. Uh, and Matthew 24, it's, it's the land of Israel. It's the, the Roman army surrounding the land. It's those curses, those covenant curses coming out of Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 16. That is what uh, Malachi is dealing with. Isaiah 40, this is the popular one. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has ended. Now, a lot of Isaiah's way that John was to prepare... Isaiah, a lot of it is the salvation, comforting the remnant, right? But it also, like I said, includes judgment. But you find the futurist always just focusing on this first part. Jesus is the way, you know, be saved and everything's good. But look down here at verse 3. A voice, that is John, cries 
in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, that is, the humble he's going to raise, um, and every mountain and hill made low, that is, he's going to base people like the Pharisees. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Let's just stop there for just a second. In ancient times, if someone was outside your city, you saw someone building a flat and even road to your city, it meant that a foreign king was going to conquer your city. They're making a, f a flat road so they can bring all their tools and their armies and their equipment to conquer your city. That's how Pompeii, that's how some of the Jews understood this um, passage as well. And so basically what John is saying is, I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. He's going to be a mighty king. You better listen to him. I'm not worthy to unloose his, a strap on his a sandal. You've got to listen to him. Because if you don't, he's going to cut you off. He's going to cut you in pieces. Repent. That's the picture here. What is he supposed to cry? Look at verse 6. Oh, voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? Well, judgment. All flesh is grass. And all the beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. Now, that is actually quoted in 1 Peter 124, and uh, in the context there and in chapter 2, we're talking about the false teachers, we're talking about an imminent judgment, so even Peter is looking at this Old Testament context, and he's applying it to an at-hand, end-of-all-things kind of judgment. It's not just some salvation that we're experiencing kind of sort of in our heart. That's not the way. But the word of our God will stand forever. Say to the cities of Judah, behold, your God Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, look at, his reward is with him. Jesus quotes this passage when he says, there's some standing here, we're not going to see death until you see me come and reward all men. <clears throat> the new exodus, an imminent not yet eschatology of Luke. Then in Luke chapter 4, Jesus, where do we see Jesus? He's in the wilderness, okay. Israel was in the wilderness, being tempted and tested for 40 years. First, they were tested for 40 days through the spies. They failed both tests. Jesus is the faithful new Israel. The new exodus is on the way. That's the whole significance here, and yet he is without sin. Luke 9, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the Holy Ones. Of course, we all have this memorized. But I tell you, or verily I say unto you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the, come, the king, kingdom of God. But like I said, look at this passage over here. This is a parallel passage. It mentions there's some differences. He talks about the, being ashamed of the adulterous generation and so forth. But we have to pay attention to the tense of verse uh, uh, 9-1. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has already come with power. Now, <clears throat> Gentry thinks he's safe because he takes this as AD 70, so he doesn't have any problem developing it. But he actually proves way, way too much. Um, he quotes G.A. Alexander where he says, here, come is not as the English words may seem to mean in the act of coming till they see it come, but actually or already come. The only sense that can be put upon the perfect participle here employed. Gentry goes on. This seems clearly to refer to, to the 8070 destruction of the temple, the removal of the Old Testament means of worship. This occurred as a direct result of Jesus' prophecies. But what's the problem? Half the church is telling us this is the second coming event. Gentry is saying, well, when it happens, it happens spiritually. And yeah, the church, after 87, he looked back and said, yeah, that coming happened. I don't have a problem at all with church history. 
I just go to this text. Now, let's say 10 years after 80, 70, let's say in 80, we have a writing that says, yep, the second coming happened in 80, 70. Would that satisfy the critics? No. You know what they'd do? They would say, this is where the heresy of full preterism started. So I don't want to play games with the church fathers and, and who's right based upon that because it always ends up biting someone in the butt. And my Reformed brethren, where was forensic justification ever taught in the church prior to Luther? If you want to play that game, we can play it. Because it wasn't. At least my view, I can, say, I can see how the church was organically building full preterism. Uh, and I believe in forensic justification, but I think they have a more bigger problem with that than we do with full preterism. <clears throat> All right, let's look at Luke 10, 10, 9, and verse 11. The kingdom of God is nearly upon you or fast approaching. Uh, the Greek word here, phanano, means the draw, to draw near, even to the point of contact. It appears 26 times in the Septuagint for the Aramaic meta, to attain, or Hebrew, naga, touch, reach, extend to. Without exception, fanthano is used in the Septuagint to describe either the action of the approaching or the precise point of the contact, but not the participation in some ensuing experience. It describes arrival upon the threshold of fulfillment and accessible experience, not the entrance into that experience. For example, in the passages such as Judges 20, verse 34, and verse 42, Daniel 2, 28, Ecclesiastes 8, 4, 1 Thessalonians 2, 16, the idea is that the disaster or the battle pursued the refugees and was thus about to overtake them. The battle was going, they were being pursued, but they hadn't overtaken the enemy yet. That's the idea. So the already really isn't even picture here. What is imminent is the actual eschatological not yet when this word is used. J.T. Mattel Jr. writes of Luke 11.20, this interpretation and translation of, of Fathano of the exorcisms is supported by the illusion of the symbol of the finger of God chapter 11, verse 20, to Exodus 8, 19, where the Egyptian magicians described the plagues as wrought by the finger of God. Just as the plagues were preliminary to the Exodus, so Jesus' exorcisms point forward to the final deliverance. So, the casting out of demons, which is, you know, where we get that uh, word for rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, harpazo, Jesus was harpazoing, he was freeing souls of this bondage. That was kind of sort of in the already, but not yet because it was only pointing to Satan's imminent defeat. Romans 6, 20, he was going to be crushed shortly, which is taken from Genesis 3, 15. All right, let's stop off here before we get to our text to Jesus' teaching on the, uh, him coming as a thief. Uh, everywhere this is described in the New Testament, there's always New Testament eminence um, connected to it. I think Peter is probably the strongest. He uses the very same terms that Jesus uses here in uh, Luke 12. They needed to watch and be ready for Christ to come as a thief. Since Jesus was ready to be revealed as a thief, they needed to watch because the end of all things was near. Jesus was coming as a thief in the book of Revelation or soon to judge Babylon, which we know is Old Covenant Jerusalem where our Lord was slain, Revelation 11. Uh, of course, in the book of Acts, Paul is telling us, I don't preach anything except what, which cannot be found in the Law and the Prophets, and he talks about the judgment of Daniel 12 and resurrection. And he says it was about to take place. 
Again, this is the eschatological not yet. <clears throat> then at the end of the Old Covenant, Jesus uses that passage, and this is how he describes it. Then, that is at the end of their Old Covenant, this age, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So in the consummation, we're getting a lot of John is preparing the way for the Son of Righteousness to come and glorify himself in his people. When that happens at the end of the Old Covenant age, the righteous are going to shine in the kingdom because the Son of God, the Son, is giving them life and he is in his people because the kingdom of God is within you. Now to our text, Luke 17, 20-37. There is a structure in this, it's called a chiastic structure, um, that links the arrival of the within kingdom with the coming of the Son of Man. You can't see that, that's too small. That's how it is structured in a chiasm, but I have... Uh, let me give you an illustration of what a chiasm is. First you have A, B, C, C. C, C is in the middle. Then you have B, and then you have A. No one can serve two masters... For neither he will hate the one and love the other, or he will, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And if you match them up, you see how they correlate to each other. This was an ancient way of memorizing things. They, that's how they memorized. They, they structured things this way so they could remember the teaching. And usually a chiasm, it starts out with something important, and it will end with something important. Just like Matthew 23, all the way through Matthew 25. Starts out, woes upon the Pharisees. You sit in Moses' seat, hypocritically judging these people. Go through, you cast, you know. And then he talks about the temple being destroyed, this generation, going to Matthew 24, and a, and a subtle reference to a sign that he's going to come on one of their feast days when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then it, then it goes through, and it ends with, who's sitting on the throne now? Christ, and he is judging the hypocrites. So that's kind of a chiasm, too, where these passages are inseparably linked. And this is important because, and here I've broken it down for you, because it starts out with a question with the Pharisees. But then Jesus takes the disciples aside, and then he wants to teach them more about the kingdom, and then it ends with where? Where, Lord? So the issue is when and where, Will the kingdom be realized when it comes? And so you have an orderly uh, structure here. The question of the Pharisees has to do with the when the where of the kingdom. Uh, it is not coming with observation. The Apostle Paul supports that. Every New Testament writer supports what Jesus says, even though futurists keep on telling us that someday we're going to see it. Jesus says you're not going to be able to see it Paul, in an eschatological not yet context, says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen. Hmm, I wonder where he's getting that. But on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And there is a, a good connection between 2 Corinthians 4 going all the way to chapter 6, verse 16, where it's taught when he says, you, the church, are the millennial temple of Ezekiel 37 Ezekiel 40 to 48, we're that temple. We're that spiritual temple. It's not a physical temple. And he says, that is what's going to come out of heaven. That's cut without hands. There's that phrase again in 2 Corinthians 5, going back to Daniel 2. And it's going to come down from heaven, and it's going to clothe the church. That's that body. That's that house. That's what we see in Revelation. That's what was coming down, the NIV translates it in the present tense in Revelation 3, 11 or 12. And then, in, and then later on, in, at the end of Revelation, it comes fully down. It's not a physical cube that's going to be hanging off the planet. That's the church. That's Mount Zion. That's the New Jerusalem. Now, let's get to the meat of the matter. All, I was amazed when I studied this. All your older commentators, there was no debate about whether we should translate this within you, within your hearts, within your soul. 
No one was saying among you. This is just a new thing. I think people are just, don't, they don't know how to deal with this. They have to get it in the eschatological already, so it has to be right there. But there is so much evidence. Let me give you the evidence when I was studying this. I was blown away. Entos is the word here. It's only used one other time in the New Testament, and it is located in Matthew 23, 26, where again there is a contrast being made between what the hypocritical Pharisees do outwardly, sitting in Moses' seat, loving to do their deeds so that they could be seen, dressed to be seen, and love the best seats to be seen. But Jesus drives out the point, drives home the point, when he addresses they are overly concerned about outward washings and cleanliness, but realizing that they are unclean and spiritually dead from the inside, entos. There are also some parallels between Matthew 23 and Luke 17, the second coming will fall upon them quickly and in their generation. Strong's also appeals to the Septuagint, which universally, universally, that's how, this is not a debate, universally translates the Old Testament Hebrew being within a building, such as the temple or something take place within a person, the inward parts of a person, or within the spiritual nature of man as contrasted with the outward. Psalm 103.1, Psalm 109.22, Isaiah 16.11. You can just go on and on and on. Outside the New Testament, entos never means among. It always means inside. In order to express among or amidst of you or in the middle of you, the New Testament always uses mesos, mesos. Already employed in the Old Testament 307 times, and in the New Testament, 27 occurrences, with Luke being the one who uses it the most among the gospel writers. So when Luke wants to communicate among or in the midst of you, he uses this word, not entos. The early church fathers, if you want to talk about the early church fathers who were closer to Koine Greek, they all translated this as within you, within your heart. Again, it's only been in recent times where people apparently struggle with this. Jesus, what did Jesus teach in John 14? I've counted four or five references to the second coming in John chapter 14. And he says, I'm going to make my mone, I'm going to make my house, I'm going to make my presence in you. I'm going to go over to prayer place, and then when it's done, I'm going to come back for you, and my father and I are going to make our home, mone, and dwell with you. And then in verse, I think it's 29, he says, when it happens, you know, you're, you're going to believe. You need to believe. It seems like a spiritual reality. Why would they have to believe something if they're flying off the earth? Kind of self-evident, isn't it? So Jesus in John 14 and here in Luke 17 is saying that the kingdom is going to be realized within you. And it's something that you're going to have to believe because you're not going to be able to see it. You're going to have to look at the destruction of the corpse of the old covenant community being dead. And that's a sign that I have come and set my kingdom in your hearts. That takes faith. And that's what John 14, 29 is talking about. That destroys the literal rapture view of Ed Stevens, hyper preterists, and all the futurists as far as I'm concerned, but I love them in the Lord, but I'm a little frustrated with their teaching. Um, look at this reference to the sun. Now, I'm going to quote Max King. Let's see if this is this the slide? All right, Max King writes. Now, remember, the passage, there's two passages that talk about Christ coming as lightning. It's here in Luke 17, and it's also in Matthew 24, verse 27. And it refers to the parousia, the presence of Christ. He comes from the east to the west in Matthew's account, right? Uh, what comes from the east to the west? Does lightning? I think it's the sun. Um, and, of course, we've looked at passages that describe the second coming as him coming as the sun. So I'm not sure why we translate that almost universally as... Sorry, I'm trying to find my... Okay, here we go. Max King writes this. 
after I become a preterist without any influence from <laughs> Max King or anyone else, I started reading all kinds of anything I could get my hands on on preterism. And I read this, and it stuck with me. Stuck with me since 1992. He says, the word lightning is translated from the Greek word ostra, ostrope, which properly means a bright shining. Evidently, most translators being influenced by the concept of Christ coming suddenly or brief give the meaning of lightning to the meaning of the word ostrope. But lightning is against the meaning of the text for two reasons. First, it seldom comes out of the east, and second, is, brief, is a brief flash, penetrates the darkness for only a moment only. But when the sun is made the source of the bright light shining, the meaning of the text is clear. First, because the sun comes out of the east and shines unto the west. And second, the rising of the sun is the dawning of a new day that dispels the darkness of the night, period. And the old covenant system was described as the night. The coming, or the parousy of Christ, was the dawning of a new day. 2 Peter 1.19, in which all things were to be made plain. The object of Christ was to warn against false concepts of his coming. Some having a fleshly concept of his coming or presence would say he is in the desert or in some secret chamber. Lo, he is here. Lo, he is there. But Christ warned his disciples to believe them not. But the bright shining that came out of the east, revealing the hidden divinity of Christ, had its fulfillment in the dawning of a new day or era of Christianity, wherein the wisdom, power, and true nature of Christ were fully received even unto the day. Until them that feareth his name, the Son of Righteousness, we've talked about that, that's what John was preparing the way of, who come with healing in his wings, the carcass and the eagles identify this event with Rome's destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, another commentator says, not defending this particular aspect, but kind of showing you what the Jews thought about um, when Messiah would come, this whole son concept. He says, the fathers and early commentators have understood Christ as the son of righteousness, and they are so far right that it is the period of his advent that is referred to. As the rising sun diffuses light and heat so that all that is heaven healthy in nature revives and lifts up its head while plants that have no depth of root, we were talking about the parable of the sower, root, are scorched up and wither away. So the advent of the reign of righteousness which will reward the good and the wicked, each according to his deserts. John Gill same thing, I'm not going to read it, but he points out that the Jews, even Philo, not only thought that the Messiah, or referred to the Messiah as Logos, he referred to him as the Son, too. And the Jews understood when Messiah would come, in the age to come, some of them had a weird view that the literal Son was going to be closer, burn up the wicked, and give them life. Guys like Philo are like, mm, I don't think it's the literal Son, it's metaphorically referring to spiritual life and would burn up. Now, some have said this can't, it's got to be lightning because, in the context, it's judgment. But the Jews understood no, when, when Messiah comes as son, it's judgment. He's going to burn the wicked and he's going to give life to his people, and they're going to be a well watered garden, and he's going to be the source of photosynthesis and give life to his people. That was the concept, and I think that's what Jesus is talking about. more of his sources. Okay, so Isaiah talks about this. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. No longer will the sun be your light by day, and the brightness of the moon will shine for you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your sorrow will be no more, will be over. And then, of course, Revelation picks up on this. It's a city of light. There's no sun because the Father and the, the Lamb is the source of light and life. And the gates are always open. Why? Well, for the preaching of the gospel, for, for those in darkness to come in, one. But two, it shows the security of those in the New Jerusalem. 
This kingdom cannot be shaken like the Old Covenant kingdom through the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And it also says in Revelation 3 that I'm going to make you a pillar, Christians, and you're not going to want to go out. We're secure in Christ. Scripture clearly teaches that Christians will have no desire to leave the gates of the city because they are a part of the city. They are the pillars. Just like you can't jump out of Christ's hand because you're in union with Christ. You're very much a part of the hand. Okay, in the midsection of this chiasm, we have the days of, of Lot and, and Noah. He's just basically saying, look, guys, when the judgment comes, they're, they're not going to care. They're going to have this lackadaisical mentality that you be watching, you be, you be remembering what I said about the signs. <clears throat> It's obviously an end-time event because he's talking to them about fleeing the city just like he does in the Olivet Discourse. Commentators say this is the second coming. Commentators say, no, it's 8070. They can't make up their mind. We solve the debate. It's both. It's like Michael Heiser. The angels did this. God did this. Yes, it's both. Um, I'm showing you some parallels between Matthew 17 and the Olivet Discourse, so there's no mistaking that it is the second coming event that is described here. Okay, again, the disciples, it, this chiasm ends with another question. Where, Lord, how is this all going to happen? Where the dead body of Judaism is, that's when the consummation takes place. Isn't that consistent with the prophets? Isaiah's little apocalypse talks about the gathering of the elect, the trumpet, the resurrection, the decreation, the recreation. It all takes place when Israel breaks the old covenant law. How is that going to take place in the future? Because all these futurists say that we're not under law. The old covenant's gone. Well, that's a problem. He says it's going to take place when Jerusalem is in rubble. Sounds like an end time event. Doesn't sound like an end of time event to me. Daniel, again, connects the consummation with the destruction of the city. Right? When the power of the holy people is completely destroyed or shattered, then the end comes. That's when the resurrection takes place. That's when the tribulation, the judgment. So... Uh, you know, the, the disciples had that concept, and Jesus had already taught them prior to his discourse here. How much time do I got, brother? All right, I, I don't... Okay, <laughs> let me go back here. Um, okay, yeah, and let's, let's kind of put an uh, exclamation mark on Luke 17. I think the chiasm there nails it, because the spiritual within kingdom comes at the end when, when Jerusalem is a dead carcass. We know that's A.D. 70. So this other reference to the time and when of the kingdom within you is talking about the consummation, not the inauguration. So that is powerful to me. But this other thing nails it on the head. The it goes on in Luke 18, and it's connected to our passage. Luke's account of Jesus' teaching often close uh, a discourse with a parable. This is Luke's pattern. He will, Jesus will teach, and he will close what he has just taught with a parable. And that's what we have here. So, in this parable of the widow crying out for justice from persecution, the unjust judge gives her justice because she's bothering him. But the point is, that will not the Son of Man, or will not God, avenge you? Will He not help you speedily? Okay. Disciples, the days are coming when you're going to want to think like the Essenes. You're going to want to think like the Pharisees. You're going to want to say, I've come back and I'm hiding somewhere in some secret room. Because the Romans... Nero and 64 are just going to persecute you, kill many of you. You're going to be tempted to want that kingdom. You're going to want me to come back and establish that kind of kingdom. But he says, you're not going to see it. That's not my kingdom. Remember, it's not of this world. So now Jesus is developing this concept that you're going to want that because of the persecution. So let me give you a parable about that that's connected to what I've just taught you. I am going to come speedily, and I am going to vindicate you. 
New Testament develops this. Jesus, of course, you know all the passages. Matthew 23, when would the martyrs be vindicated? That generation, going all the way back to Abel, all the way back to Genesis. The martyrs under the altar in uh, Revelation 6. When, Lord, when are you going to come and avenge us? In a very little while. Not 2,000 years. The New Testament confirms everything we have been teaching about an inward kingdom of God, not in the already, but in the not yet. Physical, uh, okay, under the Old Covenant, there was a physical heavens and earth. And it was a world that was passing away. And there was a spiritual heavens and earth that was in the process of being received and would soon come down out of heaven. This is one of John MacArthur's favorite books. Oh, how I wish he would read this particular section out of Isaiah 51, 15, 16. I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name, and I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundation of the earth. Well, what's John's favorite book say about this passage? Heaven and earth are here put by symbolic language for a political universe. That is, that I might make those who were but scattered persons and slaves in Egypt before a kingdom and polity to be governed by their own laws and magistrates. Interesting. So the old covenant people of God are a heavens and earth. Of course, the, under the old covenant, you had to be... You know, you were born into the kingdom physically, but Jesus says, no, nah, in the new covenant kingdom, it's all spiritual. You have to be born of the spirit, born from above. Physical tabernacle and temple. Ah. Then you see in Acts 15, you see the, the gift, the miraculous gift of knowledge, a word of knowledge, and that's not dealing with someone here with a backache out of 3,000 people, right? That's not what's taking place there. The, word, uh, the miraculous gift of knowledge that would cease in AD 70 is James' ability to see the Gentiles being converted and going to an Old Testament passage that you wouldn't think had anything to do with it and say, this is, uh, this is the rebuilding of David's tabernacle. Again, spiritual. Everything, every constituent element of a kingdom, the New Testament says, is spiritual. Sacrifices, priests, the temple, the land, it's a heavenly land that Abraham was looking for. The city, Hebrews says it was a city that was about to be revealed, Hebrews 13, 14. And look at this, as far as the temple, G.K. Beale says, the heaven and earth in the Old Testament may sometimes be a way of referring to Jerusalem or its temple for which Jerusalem is a metonym, similar to a synonym. In other words, the, these, these phrases are used with each other, and they refer to the same thing. I'm, I'm describing what the kingdom is, and God has given us a colorful uh, way of looking at it, and it's a temple, it's a land, it's a city, it's all these things, and they're interconnected, is basically what he's saying. But it's interesting that he says the temple and the land itself was heaven and earth. I got on the phone with him one time, and I said, well, why in Matthew 24, when heaven and earth passes away in the context of the temple being destroyed, why wouldn't you say that's 8070? based upon what you're writing. He got mad at me. He goes, oh, you're a heretic. It's like, huh, I'm, dude, I'm just quoting your book and I'm looking at the context. And he, he had a co-author, or I think it was this guy, who actually took that interpretation. He says, the temple was thought to correspond to, represent, or in some sense to be heaven and earth. In the totality, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, Matthew 5, 18, all refer to, to the destruction of the temple. These guys are saying what we've been saying like forever. They're finally admitting it. Uh, again, you had a physical old, you know, all of these things. I, I'm just, I'm not going to read them. They're here for you to look up in your studies, all right? Physical type, spiritual reality. I'm going to go ahead and kind of get to the point here and we're going to close. Folks, Jesus. Second coming, he was the son of righteousness. He has come, he has filled us with his presence. 
He has filled the new Jerusalem, which we are, a corporate body. He has glorified us. We talked about some of the struggles we had before service, our prayers and different things, and dealing with dentists and, and mean dentists and impatient people and, and not kind. And, but the reality is this light, this glory that we have in the new Jerusalem, we have to live this stuff out. We really have to live out what we know. God has been so good. I remember when the Lord saved me at like 18 years old. I got on my knees and I said, Lord, the, oh, this is my main request. Every time I've read the Bible in the past, I don't understand it. I want to understand it. Please, just help me understand your word. That was like, you know, Solomon said he wanted wisdom. Well, for me, I just, I just kind of want to understand the Bible because I got such bad grades in school. and just kind of. But this meant so much to me. And God's been so good. But we have to live out the kingdom. We have to live out his presence in us. And that means loving your wife, helping her do the dishes, not thinking, i got to be in my study, man. This is the kingdom, baby. This is what it's a No, man. It's loving your wife. It's being with your, your children. And you, we have to live out the kingdom. Paul says that the kingdom is what? Love, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is how it's lived out. This is how the glory of the new Jerusalem shines out into a dark place. We have to let those people in darkness see the glory and light of the sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, of God. And I guess Dave kind of has a question, period. If anyone has any questions, I don't know how I would take it online. Or anyone here, be more than happy to answer. Good? Yes, sir. No? <laughs> Start over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a personal question. When you were coming to the understanding prayers, you in your dorm, mm. how much um, flack did you get? It's interesting because I had just become a five point Calvinist. Uh, my director at Calvary Chapel got fired because I was a four point Calvinist. And Chuck Smith said, You're pumping out four point Calvinists. They're coming back to my church. I don't want anything to do with this. I came to Chuck, I said, I want to teach, I'm, people are asking me to teach, what am I do? I'll be honest, I'll be, you know, I'll present your view, I'll present mine, I'm not going to undermine you. He said, I think it's best that you leave. So I went to John MacArthur, because he was a four-point Calvinist. So I'm reading Pink's book, uh, the Baker edition, The Sovereignty of God. I'm looking in the back, where we're dealing with 1 John 2, 2, and I see the correlation to uh, John 11, 51, 52. And the lights just went on. And God was showing me it's not that you've gone too far in Calvinism. It's you, you haven't gone far enough. And that kind of blew me away because I wasn't expecting that answer. So when preterism came along, I was like, if I've been taught wrong things about the atonement, I need to look at some other views on eschatology. And that's when I started reading amillennialism. Loved amillennialism because one coming of Christ at the end of the age. Pff, real simple, two-age model, especially coming out of dispensationalism where everything's so difficult. But then... I started reading David Chilton and Gentry and Damar, and I read something where Christ was coming as a thief in Matthew 24, verse 43. And because I was studying Christ coming as a thief in 1 Thessalonians 5 as well. And Chilton, in like one sentence, said it, referred it to 8070, and that blew my mind because all these guys were always dividing, at that time, dividing Matthew 24. And I didn't think that it could be divided. Um, and I knew something was wrong. And then... I went down and I talked to him and he smiled at me. He said, I said, I'm looking at Matthew 24. I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians 4. I said, that's the same coming. It's got to be. And he smiled. He goes, you need to read a book. I said, what's that? James Stewart Russell. So I read Russell's and I was in my dorm room and I remember just jumping up. And I was like, this guy believes what I believe. The, the, the Olivet Discourse can't be divided. It's parallel to 1 Thessalonians 4. I was like, i got to find this guy. Of course, he was dead and he was old. And, um, but then it was like a lonely journey, right? Because I'm single, I'm at college, I, I want to get married. I'm, now I'm a five-point Calvinist. Who's going to marry me now? I believe in this limited time. I think, now I believe the second coming happened. Forget it. I'm never going to get married. Um, it's single for life. Right. So it was just a, it was kind of a lonely journey. But, you know... God tells Jeremiah, he tells Joshua, he says, do not fear their faces. You know, you keep going. You wanted to understand the word of God? Here it is, buddy. But it's a, it, it, 
it's a cost. There's a cost involved. And uh, that's kind of a long story, but just trying to keep it short. Any other questions? I know I've gone long. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that you are the sun. Some people believe the world revolves around the sun. Some people believe the sun revolves around the world. But Lord, in the new Jerusalem, that is the apple of your eye. And Lord, we thank you that you love us so much, that you have come and you have overtaken us with your kindness, with your compassion, with your love, and given us this glorious truth, this positional truth, that we are pure and spotless in your eyes, and we can behold your face, and we're a new creation, and you don't remember our sins anymore. God, that's the message of the church. It's not that some physical city is going to come down someday. Lord, we have perverted your kingdom. Cause the church to repent and get back to sound exegetical teaching. Lord, we love you. Just be with us in our fellowship and your providence today. We pray for our pastor. Uh, we pray for Kathy. We pray for their family. We pray that you would open ministry for them, Lord, on this time off and that they would long to come back. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.